Okay, so I am literally in the spot. <laughs> okay, this is the first experience for us to host such an event here in the Asian Radio Room. So, uh, my name is Qi Chiu, Head of Scholarly Services at the Asian Radio Room. So, on behalf of the Asian Division, I uh, welcome you to this afternoon's event and to our Radio Room. It's, I especially appreciate your coming out this afternoon on on such a you know snowy, rainy day. It's not the best day, but we do appreciate your efforts. So before, for this afternoon's program, uh, after my welcome remarks, our uh, jo Dr. Jonathan Lohr, who is our South Asian librarian, he will give an introduction of our South Asian collection and will also introduce our speaker, Dr. Solomon from uh, the University of uh, Washington. So as you have already seen, this is a beautiful reading room. And if you haven't had a chance to know more about it, here are some highlights of our facilities and services. And I know many of you, I see some familiar faces. Some of you are very familiar with our services. So pardon me for the repetition. That I will just take a few minutes. So this reading room is home to multi-language reference materials on Asian studies. It is also where users can access both physical and digital materials in Asian language and get research assistance from our uh, reference specialists. We started collecting Asian language materials as early as the 19th late 19th century, and today the collections have grown to represent one of the most comprehensive collections of Asian studies in the world. That is, more than four million physical items and numerous digital resources. These items are in over 190 languages and include most subject fields covering an area ranging from the South Asian subcontinent and Southeast Asia to East Asia. So our reading room, the Asian reading room, opens Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 5 p.m. Any users 16 years or older can come to use the library reading rooms. All you need to do is to bring a, a photo ID and get a reader registration card, which is also located on the first floor of the Jefferson Building. Of course, it's always a good idea to check out our website and library uh, catalog before you come to the library so that you can find the materials that you are looking for and make better uses of your time in the library. On our website, you can use the link marked Ask a Librarian to ask research questions, uh, to request materials and to make appointments with librarians to use rare items. So ask a librarian is an important phrase for you to remember. It is actually the tour to find answers to almost all of your inquiries. Also on our website, you can find information on our collections, databases, digital collections, research guides, and blogs. And yes, we do have social media representations. We have blogs and we have a uh, Facebook post, a Facebook page of all of the international collections in our library. So since uh, Flores Tan Mosin Fellowship for this year just opened, I would like to raise your attention to this fellowship that funds researchers to come to our reading room to conduct research. You can check out the application information on our website or on our Facebook page. It, uh, the deadline for application is at the end of January, so we would encourage you to spread words among your colleagues, friends, and students who are interested in coming out to DC and to use our collection materials for their research uh, projects. So with that, I will hand it over to Jonathan Lohr for a brief introduction of our Southeast Asian collection. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Asian Reading Room of the Library of Congress. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lohr, and I'm the reference librarian uh, for the South Asian Collection, which contains materials from Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. So before we get started, I just wanted to give a very, very brief overview of our South Asian collection, which contains approximately 330,000 monographic volumes, more than 1,000 journals, and over 68,000 titles on microform in over 100 languages of the South Asian region. So that means we have substantial holdings in Hindi, Urdu, 
Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Bengali, Gujarati, Punjabi, Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit, and many other languages. Most of this acquisition comes from the library's two overseas offices, one in New Delhi, established in 1962, and one in Islamabad, established in 1965. On the countertops here in the reading room, you'll see some samples from our collections, books about Buddhism in general, and about the ancient region of Gandhara in particular, both in English and also in Asian languages. We invite everyone to come and spend some time here with our collections in the Asian Reading Room. And as Dr. Chu just said, if you have a question about our collections, we have our Ask a Librarian service to answer anything uh, pertaining to your research or general curiosity. I would also like to remind everyone here today that today's program will be recorded and later released as a webcast. So please turn off or silence your mobile phones and other devices. And also please hold your questions until the end. And please be advised that any questions you may ask during the Q&A will be recorded and the act of asking a question constitutes permission for us to record and broadcast later as part of our webcast. For South Asia at the Library of Congress, I believe you could call the subject of today's lecture a top treasure, namely the birch bark scroll from the ancient Buddhist region of Gandhara. And to get to know this treasure, there is no better resource than the experts on the history, language, and culture out of which this manuscript came to be. Dr. Richard Solomon is Emeritus Professor of Sanskrit and Buddhist Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. In addition to being the director of the British Library and University of Washington's Early Buddhist Manuscript Project, he is the author of many public publications on early Buddhism, many of which uh, are on display here in the Asian Reading Room today. His most recent book, his fourth on Gandhari manuscripts, is titled Buddhist Literature of Ancient Gandhara, an Introduction with Selected Translations. Translation number eight in this book is the Mini Buddhas Sutra, which is the scroll here at the Library of Congress. And now for more on this scroll, I'd like to welcome Dr. Richard Solomon. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is the microphone on? I, I don't have a good projecting voice, so I want to be sure you all, all can hear. So, uh, first of all, uh, thank you. Thanks to John for the uh, very nice introduction. Second, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, when I saw the weather this afternoon, I had the concern that I was going to just be speaking to an empty room this evening, uh, but I see that you've all... Uh, braved this nasty weather to come, and I thank you for that, and I will try to make it worth the effort. Uh, so I'm going to start my presentation uh, with a description of the physical characteristics of the manuscript. Contents and significance will come later. Um, so the manuscript is called, as you see here, uh, next slide. The title of the manuscript, or to be accurate, the title which I attribute to the manuscript is the Mini Buddha Sutra, uh, Mini Buddha Sutra, uh, which is my translation of the conjectural title, original title. It's not actually there in the manuscript. Uh, Bahu Buddha Sutra. Please note the asterisk. A scholarly convention means that that's a reconstructed title. I didn't make it up uh, totally. Uh, I borrowed it from a related and somewhat similar uh, text ex which exists in Sanskrit uh, as part of the Mahavastu. So it's a conjectural but pretty likely title. Uh, the actual title of the manuscript uh, would have been on uh, some of the part, uh, the part that's uh, incomplete, that's missing. Uh, so that's why I have a hypothetical title. And I'll show you the details of that a little later. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, briefly, the big picture. Uh, this is one of several hundred manuscripts discovered within the last 20 years from the ancient region of Gandhara. And uh, I'll, I'll show a map uh, later if you're not familiar with uh, Gandhara and where it is. Uh, I'll get back to that. Um, <clears throat> but. We now know of several hundred manuscripts, uh, all, almost all of them like this one, a birch bark scroll, um, and written in the Gandhari language, which I'll 
describe a little bit later on, and in the Kuroshti script, which you'll also see uh, some illustrations of. Uh, and these manuscripts date between the first century BC and the third century AD, uh, so they're clearly the oldest manuscripts uh, of any, uh, any manifestation of the Buddhist, of Buddhism. Uh, and they're also the oldest South Asian manuscripts in existence. Uh, so uh, here you see the scroll as it was delivered to, uh, to the library. Um, the main piece is at the bottom, rolled up uh, piece of birch bark, and the top piece on top is uh, actually would have been an adjoining piece, but it had already uh, broken off. Uh, you might notice, uh, I don't know if you can see from, from where you're sitting, but uh, the, the two look quite different, and the, and the reason is that they are in a different handwriting. And the reason for that is that when the scroll was unrolled and examined, it turned out that one scribe, I could just call him Scribe A, had written the front, and then he'd handed it off to another scribe, I call him Scribe B, and the back is uh, in a quite distinctly different writing. So that's what you're seeing here. This is from the top upper one is from the, uh, the recto, that is the front side, and the lower one is from the verso or back side. Um. <clears throat> Looking at another angle on this manuscript, uh, this is how it looked before it was unrolled and conserved, uh, looking at it from the end. And you can see uh, pretty clearly how the, uh, the scroll is rolled up. Uh, and you can see how delicate and fragile this material is. Uh, if you've probably seen a piece of birch bark, you can, if nobody's looking, you can pull it off a tree and, and it's beautiful white uh, um, durable and very flexible and very nice looking material when it's new, when you pull it off the tree. When it's 2,000 years old, it's extremely fragile and delicate and you can see any, oh, it's little bits falling off of it no matter how careful uh, you are. Uh, another extra problem, uh, I, I've boxed in an example of what we call delamination. Uh, so actually birch bark consists of constituent layers. There's usually three layers that you can't see when, when it's fresh, you wouldn't notice. Uh, but again, when it dries out, uh, it, those layers sometimes pull apart and sometimes they completely uh, separate. Um, and that causes all kinds of problems when you're trying to reconstruct the manuscript because you not only have uh, several, um, the manuscript itself is broken into component parts, as you'll see, but the component parts are sometimes the front and the back are completely separated, and it's not always at all obvious which, where, which, where and how they uh, go together. So anyway, this is uh, what came to the library some years ago, and the first problem is uh, what to do with that. Uh, it has to be conserved and unrolled, and. Uh, here they are. Uh, this is uh, on the left is Holly Kruger of the Library of Congress, and at the right is Mark Barnard, uh, who was imported from the British Library uh, as a special consultant uh, because he was the most experienced person. He had uh, unrolled two prior groups of man similar uh, types of manuscripts discovered uh, again in the fairly recent past. Uh, so we had really an A-team conserving uh, this difficult manuscript. And here's just a, a detailed shot of how they do it, in a word, very carefully. Um, and uh, here's, um, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, so here you see the implements that they use and how they're working together carefully. And this is uh, the result, or... Uh, at least the uh, preliminary results. So this is the recto side, uh, unreconstructed. In other words, that's how it actually looks uh, and how it looks in those uh, facsimile images in the back of the, uh, the room, which you can look at later, um, as, as it uh, came apart. Uh, several changes had to be made. Particularly, there were these three pieces, loose pieces at the top, and you saw one of them in the first image, and there were uh, two others came, came apart. Um, and the conservators had no way to know exactly where they belonged. 
um, and the scroll, as it was unrolled, was placed on a sheet of glass, and when they were finished, they put another piece of glass on, seal it, and that's a, a permanent disposition of it. Uh, but some of these pieces are not actually in their correct position, uh, particularly those three at the top. So I'll show you the next image is the reconstructed version, and you'll see those pieces are uh, reverse, reversed and flipped over like that and that. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Photoshop. Uh, all the reconstruction uh, is done on, on screen with Photoshop. Uh, the original, uh, as you'll see it back there, remains as it was unrolled. Uh, and this is sort of a typical problem. We have these problems all, almost always with birch bark uh, scrolls when they get unrolled. They don't come out all nice and neat and clear. Um, you'll notice uh, in the reconstructed image the wear pattern, and this is again very typical of uh, birch bark scrolls. Uh, the best part is the bottom. So you can see clearly the farther you go up you go, uh, the worse the condition gets. And that's not the original top. At the top there were some more lines missing, apparently, probably not too many. Uh, so this is actually, believe it or not, one of the best preserved birch bark scrolls. A lot of them are worse than this. Uh, but there's something missing at the top and there are those spaces between the pieces are, are intentional and planned, so they represent places where the intermediate text was lost. Uh, but as I said, this is very typical. The bottom is always the best part. Why? Because uh, when they finish the scroll, they would roll it up and they'd roll it up from the bottom. So when it's rolled, the bottom is on the inside and it's protected, and the top is on the outside and it's most subject to wear. So it's uh, very rare that we actually get the top of the manuscript. And that causes plenty of problems because, well, that's one of the reasons that I don't really know the name of the title of the text because in Indian books, the title is written usually at the end, not at the beginning. Seems strange to Western way of doing things, but that's the typical pattern. So the, uh, the title, the colophon containing the title would have been at the top of the back and we, that's a part that uh, we don't have. Um, this is the verso uh, and you can see it's just the same thing turned around and you can see how they do that. They write from the top to the bottom and then flip it over the long way and write from the bottom to the top. So that means we're missing, typically in this case, and typically we're missing the beginning and the end of the text, which are the parts that you most want to see when you're trying to analyze it, but uh, usually we don't have it. So we look at similar related texts, uh, we extrapolate, we make up a title, we do the best we can. Uh, now, uh, I've, I don't know if it's clear, I've uh, boxed in a, a portion of the top of the verso, the top of the back side, uh, and that's going to be shown in detail in the next uh, slide. So I just wanted to give you a, a bit of a closer look at uh, part of that relatively well-preserved uh, part of the text. Um, it's not as well-preserved as it looked because if you look closely, I don't know if you can see from there, but actually there are many little bits, sections of the um, bark that have uh, delaminated and are actually misplaced. So uh, if you look closely, you see some of those lines are jagged and interrupted, and that's delamination. So this is what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, is trying to figure out where those loose bits uh, actually uh, correctly belong. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this is uh, and just an example of uh, the text, I'll explain a little more uh, later on, uh, but it's talking about when the life in, in Buddhist cosmic time, the lifetime of the various uh, Buddhas, um, and also it's explaining in a kind of punning way the name of the Buddha, his name is Padmotara because he's pure like a lotus Padma. Um, so that's a typical rhetorical device. So that's uh, about the manuscript itself. Uh, now I'd like to s give you a little bit of background on the date and chronological and historical context of the uh, manuscript. Uh, so this manuscript has been uh, tested by uh, radiocarbon dating 
twice in two different labs, and the results are here, and the results are a little disturbing because they should be the same, theoretically, but they're not, um, and there's been some discussion of that, and probably there was some contamination. These things were packed in cotton wool uh, when they were shipped here, and uh, that may have contaminated uh, and uh, um, damaged the accuracy of the test. So, um, w and there's really no way to know which is the more accurate uh, result, the one in Australia, number one, or the one that was done in uh, University of Arizona, number two. Uh, so, all in all, we have a big possible span from 2000, 206 BC to one, what does it say, uh, 130, 133 CE. Um, but that's not, it's not a major problem because it's all in the ballpark. And since then, uh, m quite a few other manuscripts of similar type have been tested. And they fa all fall in period between 1st century BC to 3rd century AD. And for specific reasons that I'm not going to take the time uh, to explain now, but I'm pretty sure that this manuscript is either 1st century BC or 1st century CE. So uh, we, we have a pretty good idea of uh, where we are historically. Uh, and that fits right in pretty well, quite well, with what we understand of the historical circumstances or historical context of this uh, manuscript. So let's uh, talk for a few minutes about the ancient region of Gandhara in the period in question, end of BC, beginning of CE period. Uh, so Gandhara, uh, I've learned from speaking about this in many places that some people know where Gandhara is and a lot of people don't. So I'll tell you in case you're in the latter category. So this is uh, a detailed map of, uh, of western and northwestern India and the area, the rather small area um, circled in green, I hope you can see that, uh, at least where it is, uh, is what we call Gandhara proper. The city, you, you can't read it on this map, but the modern city that that's surrounding is Peshawar in northwestern Pakistan. So the uh, valley, the, called the Peshawar Valley, or the area of the Peshawar River, um, small area, 100 and 20 miles from east to west is the, uh, the Gandhara region proper. But there's also uh, it's a bigger, it's a much bigger surrounding region I call Greater Gandhara, uh, which is the region, the cultural region, which in the period in question, period I was talking about, uh, was under the influence or within the cultural sphere of, uh, of Gandhara itself. Um, the reason that happens, the reason that you get a thing called Greater Gandhara is in the period in question, again, first century BC to second, third century AD, uh, Gandhara was uh, very much a political and cultural center, major political and cultural center in India and uh, adjoining regions uh, as well. Uh, in this period, uh, there were a series of invasions or immigrations or movements, whatever you want to call it, uh, by peoples from the north, from Central Asia, from the west, uh, from, uh, uh, from Iran, and from other places as well, who uh, came into this uh, sort of what some historians call the funnel that leads immigrants and movements across Asia into India uh, through particularly the Khyber Pass is the most famous site in, in that uh, pattern. Um, so these uh, immigrants came into India, uh, set up a series of kingdoms and eventually a, the great Kushan Empire in the period in question, uh, and they on the one hand imposed their power, but they rapidly uh, uh, assimilated into an Indian cultural uh, milieu. And the best and easiest way to do that is to become Buddhist, because Buddhism is open to all. So what happened is that these, these barbarian conquerors very quickly became the great patrons of uh, well, generous and um, 
wealthy and generous patrons of Buddhist uh, monasteries and institutions, uh, and that led to a great flourishing of Buddhism in Gandhara in the period in question, and uh, this textual material we're dealing with is one manifestation of that flourishing period of Buddhism. Uh, the, these foreign invaders, as they might be called, are uh, known to us from the manuscripts, but also from uh, a very large uh, number of physical remains, including uh, inscriptions recording their donations. So this is just one example, a fairly typical example uh, from the first century uh, of a reliquary uh, dedicated by a a member of the royal family of these Scythians or Saka, uh, Indo-Scythian rulers of northwestern uh, India, uh, with a beautiful inscription uh, around the top. And I don't know if you can see, there are a few letters that are in gold. So actually, originally the whole inscription was inlaid with gold wire, uh, and uh, most of them disappeared, but for uh, some reason, two or three of the letters are still out there original golden, sort of emblematic of the generosity uh, of their patronage. So uh, in the period that I'm talking about, Gandhara became a major center in some sense, in some senses even the, the major center of Buddhism uh, in, uh, South, in the South Asian continent. And uh, this had even greater historical uh, consequences because we now know, and it's gradually becoming clearer, how Buddhism actually left the motherland of India and went into Central Asia through Gandhara. And we are now getting very clear evidence of that, that uh, Gandharan uh, travelers went into Central Asia, brought Buddhism, and from there, Buddhism spread to China, to Korea, and Japan. So, uh, Gandhara is really a critical node, not just in uh, Indian history, but in the entire history of uh, Buddhism. Um, the other best known manifestation uh, of, Buddh of Gandharan Buddhism uh, is in its very abundant uh, school of, uh, Buddhist, of sculpture and other arts. Uh, and I find, my, I find that in general audiences, that's what people are aware of if they have any acquaintance with uh, Gandhara. Uh, and uh, Gandharan sculpt, Buddhist sculpture, and again, just about the same period, the time period that I'm talking about, first to third century AD, uh, you can see specimens of that in most major museums anywhere in the world, including right here in Washington, D.C., in the, excuse me, in the Freer Gallery, there's this uh, very amazing uh, set of four friezes uh, illustrating the four major events of the Buddha's life. So if you're not familiar, I definitely recommend a trip over there, right worth it. So I'll just show you these uh, as a local example. Uh, so the first of the great events is, of course, the miraculous birth, of uh, Buddha coming out of the, the right side of his mother. Uh, and this is the enlightenment uh, Buddha in, in, in meditation, and all around him are the, uh, the army of Mara, uh, the, the anti-Buddha, uh, attacking him, trying to scare him, trying to distract him, and of course they can't. And you have that sort of what I call the force field around Buddha, and they're all coming at him, but there's this uh, blank area where they can't penetrate. Um, and at the lower left is Mara in dejection because he sees that he's losing the battle. And then the third uh, is the first sermon in the uh, deer park in Sarnath. And you can see the two uh, deer at the bottom of the chair and that's the, uh, at the bottom of the, the seat. Uh, that's the emblem of this uh, great event. And then finally the Parinirvana, the passing, the final passing away uh, of the Buddha. So these are absolutely basic to the biography of the Buddha, uh, but what might seem odd is that the text that I'm here to talk about, which is 
about the life of the, uh, of the Buddhas. Uh, these are not mentioned at all in that text because uh, this, the kind of the biography that I'm gonna be talking about is not a conventional biography, at least in uh, modern uh, terms. Uh, it works quite uh, differently. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. <coughs> um, Uh, I want to add a little more uh, background information on the nature of Buddhist canons. Um, <clears throat> Buddhist canons are not like the canons of, say, Islam or Judaism, where you have a single, clearly defined, invariable, uni unilingual uh, text or corpus of text. Buddhist canons are multiple, they exist in different forms in different languages uh, from different parts of the Buddhist world. Uh, basically, the best known and most important Buddhist canons are in Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, and Tibetan. Uh, the Sanskrit is an incomplete uh, canon uh, known from fragmentary remains, mostly from uh, Central Asia and from China. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Buddhism, in a way, you can compare more to Christianity in terms of its approach to language and text and canon. Um, because uh, like Christianity, Buddhism is a religious tradition that encourages translation. Again, in contrast to Islam and Judaism, where if you read the Quran or you read the Torah, you read it in Arabic or Hebrew, respectively, uh, because that's the essence of it, and if you translate it, it's just some pale imitation. That's not the idea in Buddhism. Uh, and the Buddha was said to have explained to his followers in a famous passage, speak, to explain the Dharma in, to people in their own language. So right from the beginning, there was um, the desire, preference for um, a translation. So that's relevant to what I'm discussing here, uh, because we now have a increasingly large body, several hundred manuscripts, mostly fragment, almost all fragmentary, in the Gandhari language, which I will explain in a moment. Um, so I am willing to go out on a limb and say that there was a, a, a complete Gandhari canon in antiquity. Uh, it disappeared until recently. Why? Well, simply because Gandhara ceased to be part of the Buddhist world over Buddhism died out a thousand, at least a thousand years ago in Gandhara, uh, and it was completely forgotten until uh, recently. Uh, so I would make the case that we're actually re rediscovering an unknown canon of Buddhism. And that's the canon that has been translated into Gandhari language. And uh, the Gandhari language was, in its day, um, just the, the local vernacular language of the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. So it's linguistically related fairly closely to Pali and Sanskrit. And so I just have a, a quickie comparison chart for those of you who uh, are familiar with or interested in this sort of thing. So uh, the same verse in Gandhari, Sanskrit, and Pali. And uh, I tried to clarify it by, I picked one word which in bold face, which is the word for uh, a man uh, or a human being. So and you can see the relationships, Manoshe in Gandhari, Manushya in Sanskrit, and Manus, Manuso in Pali, uh, and so forth. You can uh, make what you will uh, of that. Uh, the Gandhari language uh, is always, or almost always, connected with the Kuroshti script, uh, which looks something like this. Uh, Kuroshti script, uh, which is written from right to left, although not in this uh, example, uh, is unlike the Gandhari language, which is an Indian, of Indian origin, the Kuroshti script is of Western, that is Semitic origin, uh, derived or connected with the uh, Aramaic script. So this is the uh, alphabetical order, the character set of uh, Kuroshti script, uh, but it's written in the Western way, left to right. Uh, and it's <clears throat> that alphabet is called Arapachana at the top. Why Arapachana? Well, that's why. 
uh, just the first five letters. So just as we say alphabet, we call it alphabet just by citing the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, same principle. It was common in many other uh, script or language groups. So that's the Arapachana alphabet. Uh, and this is a, a chart um, which shows the, uh, illustrates the relationship between the Aramaic script and the Kuroshti script. And I just circled some examples where it's relatively clear uh, the der derivation and connection uh, with the Aramaic prototype. Uh, it's actually a complicated and controversial and interesting uh, topic, but uh, I, I won't go into it uh, here. So uh, that's all more or less by way of background. Now I'll come to the main point, uh, context and significant, uh, significance of the Library of Congress uh, scroll. Uh, what's it about? Well, we, I call it the Many Buddha Sutra, Buddha Sutra, uh, I would describe it as a combined comparative biographical summary of the lives of 15 Buddhas, beginning with Dipankara, who lived many billions of years ago, and ending with Shakyamuni, or uh, Siddhartha, or our Buddha, as he's sometimes called, and then going on one more to Maitreya or Ajita, who is the next Buddha. So it goes 14 Buddhas in the past and one Buddha in the future. So these are the, uh, uh, the 15 Buddhas involved. Start with uh, Dipankara. Number 14 is Shakyamuni, who actually is Shakyamuni II, uh, surprisingly, and then on to Maitreya in, uh, in the future. <laughs> but this biography is not the kind of biography that you saw in those four uh, sculpted, sculpted images that I showed you before. In fact, those four uh, great, the, uh, great events, the four prime events of the Buddha, Buddha's life are not mentioned at all in this strange kind of uh, biography. So what is it about? Well, I've summarized that in this chart. Uh, there are seven points of information and which are enumerated for each of the Buddhas. So it starts out with the predictions. I'll explain the significance of that a little bit later. Uh, and the predictions made by each of the 15 uh, Buddhas uh, and so forth. So for example, number uh, three, uh, I'll show later, the life it tells you how long each uh, Buddha lasted. So it's not a narrative uh, presentation. It's a summary of information. And uh, that has its own significance and importance, which I'll try to clarify as I go through. So uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show you the specific, the, the full information. Uh, I've picked item five, social class, the varna, it's called in Sanskrit, which of the four classes of society each of the Buddhas was. And I, I picked that one. I show that one because it's short and I can fit it all in one slide. Um, so. Uh, we read the Dipankara went forth, that means you know, became a Buddha approximately, uh, from a Brahmin family, so Vabibhu from a Kshatriya family, uh, Padmotara was a Brahmin, Ajitsagaman was a Kshatriya, on and on and on. Um, maybe not the most exciting reading to the uninitiated. This is, this is the part that I don't show my undergraduate students. You can imagine their eyes glazing over. Um, but it has considerable interest and significance. I'm not going to go into this example here, although it implies something about the social views of uh, ancient Buddhism. Um, but I want to show uh, another one. This is another category, category three in the seven points of information, uh, which is the lifespans of the Buddha. And I couldn't fit in all 15 uh, Buddhas, uh, all, all 15 Buddhas, so I just give approximately the last, uh, the last half. Um, and here uh, you'll see a clear progression. Uh, so Vipassian, Buddha number eight, lived for 80,000 years, uh, Buddha number nine, 70,000 years, et cetera, et cetera, down to number 13, who is Kashyapa, the immediate predecessor of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, he lived for 20,000 years, and I, and this is Shakyamuni, 
by the way, this whole text is, of course, rec being recited, told by Shakyamuni. Uh, he said, predicts that he will live only uh, 80 years. So you see a very pronounced, drastic, downward progression <laughs> in the lifetime of the Buddhas. And this is a matter of concern because uh, a year in the life of the Buddha, or a day, or an hour in the life of the Buddha is a very precious thing. Uh, so it, it gives you the sense of the world getting somehow um, deteriorating. Um, well, the world is always deteriorating, or so it always seems. Uh, but when you look at the, uh, the next item, which is category four, the periods, the historic periods in which the Buddha has lived, you actually get a different message or a different picture. So here we have, uh, I was able to fit all 15 on. So this is the historical progression, um, the sweep of history, when, when these earlier Buddhas lived and when the future Buddhas will live. Um, so uh, uh, Divakara, actually the same as Dipankara, uh, lived in an uncountable eon before the present eon. Um, I'll try to explain briefly Buddhist cosmology. It's a little uh, different than what you might be used to. Uh, an uncountable eon is, is it's a technical term. It doesn't mean you can't count it. It means it's so huge. So an, an uncountable eon is, I believe, the best calculation I've been able to find is 10 to the 154th power number of years. So virtually uh, uncountable. Uh, the next Buddha, Savavibhu, 10 million eons. Uh, the third, 100,000, and so forth, 1,500. So you see a different uh, kind of progression. You see in, uh, for instance, in number nine and 10, you have two Buddhas, Shikkin and Vishwabhu, who lived in the same eon, and then the 11 through 15, um, 15 are all in the same eon, and that's the eon that we're living in now. And that's called the Bhadra Kalpa, the, and because Bhadra means good, happy, fortunate, uh, because it's the era in which uh, many Buddhas are living. So you get, there's a kind of balance between the decrease in the lifetime of the Buddhas, in, in the lifespan of the Buddhas, but they're getting more frequent in, in history. Uh, <clears throat> There's another related text which contains these lists of Buddhas and their times and their characteristics. It's called the Bhadrakalpika Sutra. Some of you might be familiar with it. And Bhadrakalpika means, it talks about the Bhadra Kalpa. Kalpa means eon. And it's a list of Buddhas, but not from the past, but looking ahead in the future. Uh, so it actually starts with the first Buddha in the Bhadrakalpa, that is Krakochanda, and goes through uh, Shakyamuni, our Buddha, and um, Maitreya, and then 996 more Buddhas will, are still to come within this Bhadra era. Um, so uh, this is very important for Buddhist practice or so, uh, philosophy or soteriology because the point is to give encouragement and comfort uh, that Buddhas will, there, although we, we have missed the Buddha, we living now, we're not during the lifetime of the Buddha, but there will be Buddhas to come and in future years, if we pursue the Buddhist path, we might get the blessing of actually someday, a million years from now or a billion years from now, actually see and, t uh, and uh, be in the presence of, of the Buddha. So there's a balance of the downward trajectory of the world in general, but the increasing promise of increasing numbers of Buddhas. Let me turn to my uh, next topic, which is how many Buddhas are there? So uh, at this point, you might be wondering, uh, the text that I'm primarily concerned with contains uh, 15 Buddhas. Uh, I've mentioned another one that enumerates 1,001 Buddhas. And there are many other uh, numbers. Uh, there's a famous uh, early sutra, the Mahavadana Sutra, which uh, has seven Buddhas, which seems to be the original number. Um, there's another Pali text called Buddhavamsa, which lists 25 Buddhas. And significantly in that case, uh, 
the it lists 25 Buddhas, but it begins with Dipankara. Uh, and that's particularly an important moment within the uh, li the uh, history of the Buddhas, plural. Dipankara has a special importance, which I will explain uh, in a few minutes. Uh, just I'll mention one other number, the Mahavastu, which is a Sanskrit uh, biography of the Buddha, also has a list of Buddhas. It has a long list, 331,140,263 Buddhas from the remote inconceivable past down to the present time of uh, Shakyamuni. So how many Buddhas are there? Well, let me come back to the point about Dipankara. Why is Dipankara special in these lists? Why, do, why is he stressed in most of them and in at least two important cases, including our manuscript, uh, it begins with him? Well, because he's the Buddha who produced our Buddha Shakyamuni. Um, and by produced, uh, I will try to explain that. I say he inspired the, the the, the person who would eventually be reborn as the Buddha, he inspired him to become a Buddha, and he actually predicted that, he, that that being would become a Buddha. So let me explain how, or show how that happened. Um, here, I've just given you the basic list, but I've uh, uh, emphasized Dipankara and Shakyamuni because they have this special connection. And this is the famous scene where it all started. Um, this is where a young man, a very handsome young man named Megha or Sumedha, different names, um, in <coughs> extremely remote past in the time of Dipankara, was walking down the street and he saw the Buddha, the Buddha Dipankara. Uh, and he was overcome with the power and uh, radiance of the Buddha, and the Buddha was walking along the road, and maybe it was like today, the road was wet and muddy, and he didn't want the Buddha to get his feet dirty, so he undid, he had, he had this beautiful long thick hair, and he, but, sorry, uh, he threw it over the, um, over the road for the Buddha to walk on to keep his feet dry, and the Buddha, seeing that, said, knew that this man, Megha, was special and had a special destiny, and predicted that he would in the future become a Buddha, and Omega was inspired to uh, pursue the path, path, and eventually, after millions and millions of lifetimes, he in fact came, became uh, the Buddha. And that's what we see here in this Gandharan sculpture. Um, so, the point is, where do Buddhas come from and how many are there? The answer is Buddhas come from other Buddhas. Every, a Buddha pre predicts and produces, inspires the uh, attainment of Buddhahood by another person or by other people in, in the long future. Uh, so how many Buddhas are there? I can finally come back to the question. Infinite number. Why infinite? Because time is infinite in the Buddhist conception, both in the past and in the future. There is no beginning, there is no end. And throughout history, Buddhas are either present or more, uh, more most of the time, in the process of forming at some time. And that's why the Mahavastu can say, in all seriousness, that there are 331 million, etc. cetera, uh, Buddhas. There are actually much more than that. There are an infinite number. Uh, but these different texts or these different spe um, presentations, usually by the Buddha himself, uh, simply address the issue or explain the issue in a limited scope because you can't, uh, well, the Buddha can talk about it, understand eternity, but we can't. So it takes, these different texts are really slices of history slices of Buddha history, which is infinite from, time, from beginning to end. Some of them talk about the recent past. Some of them talk about a little farther in the past. Some go into the future. Some are concerned mainly with the future. But they're all just pieces of the big picture. Uh, I call them slices of, uh, of history. Um, let me turn to my penultimate topic, which is uh, to step back and try to say, give you some idea of the importance of this text and the position of this text uh, within Buddhist literature uh, more broadly. 
I think I've already, <coughs> excuse me, I hope I've already made it clear that this text is new, it's a text we've never seen before, but it's by no means totally unprecedented. We have similar texts or texts of a similar theme in other texts in other parts of the Buddhist, of Buddhist literature, uh, and that's why I, I borrowed the title Mini Buddha Sutra, Bahu Buddha Sutra, from uh, another Sanskrit uh, book that has a, a similar uh, portion. Uh, so, uh, and, and that's interesting now, now I'm seeing in terms of the history of Buddhist literature, uh, what this is showing us. Um, we find similar descriptions of the uh, Buddhas in, later, in other Buddhist literature, it's Sanskrit, Pali, Chinese, um, but they are usually incorporated into much bigger texts like the Mahavastu or the Mula Sarasthivada Vinaya, uh, these enormous multi-volume texts. Um, what we have here are, we are finding the actual component parts of some of those massive texts. So it's beginning to become clearer that there was a process, for lack of a better term, I call it the clumping process in the history of Buddhist literature, that individual, what were originally individual texts have tended to get squished together into these sort of encyclopedic um, uh, long works. Uh, uh, there are other texts which are more or less familiar. Uh, we have for instance, Gandhari versions of texts that were known in essentially the similar form uh, in other languages, usual Pali, Sanskrit, Chinese, or combinations uh, thereof. Uh, so these are not new texts, but they are new versions of, old, uh, of previously known texts. So that's, it's less spectacular, but to the specialist, it's extremely interesting because you can do all sorts of comparis textual comparisons of uh, the details and relationships. Uh, so you know, to us, it's as exciting as if uh, someone discovered the putative Aramaic or original form of the Gospels, New Testament Gospels, known only in, in, in Greek. So that's a big deal for us. Um, and then there's a third class of uh, material in this uh, Gandhari literature, um, which I haven't talked about and I don't have time to introduce, but I, I just wanted to say uh, there are texts which are completely new, for which we have no parallel or no approximate relate, uh, similar approximately similar material in any of the other uh, several Buddhist literatures. Uh, and uh, these are uh, great eye-openers. They give us uh, views of new dimensions of Buddhist doctrine and Buddhist literature that we uh, had no idea of in many cases. Uh, <clears throat> so what do we have? A uh, couple hundred, hundred um, scraps of uh, partial texts which uh, are clearly part of what was originally a much larger literature. I think Gandhari, Gandhari Buddhist literature in its day, there must have been thousands of different texts uh, in existence. Uh, so it's very much a tip of the iceberg situation, but you, know, you can look at the tip and if you look closely enough, you can sort of extrapolate the, uh, uh, the picture of the Ice, the whole iceberg. I have a, a larger vision or fantasy that, it, that of uh, Indian, original Indian Buddhism as a, an ocean with many icebergs, each representing the local uh, textual traditions or the local canons of the different parts of the Indian world. Um, we know those icebergs are mostly gone, they've melted away. Uh, we have a few of them. We have the Pali Canon. We have the partial Sanskrit Canon. Uh, but I have the feeling now that there were many local canons. All had a common core. That I don't mean to give the idea they're completely different. They had a common core, but they had many different uh, texts in and around that basic commonality. Um, those other Buddhist literatures or canons, uh, most of them are gone, and uh, I would say there's no hope of finding them, um, for, mainly for a simple physical reason. 
um, the climate of India, of India proper, uh, is such that uh, organic materials, manuscripts, never last for more than a few hundred years. Uh, there are really no really old manuscripts in India proper. Uh, you only get the ancient manuscripts from the borderlands of India, in this case Gandhara, which has a more moderate climate and more uh, conducive to the survival of uh, uh, organic materials of uh, manuscripts. Uh, so I'm s extrapolating and I'm going out on a limb a little bit. From the tip of the Gandharan iceberg, I, I try to see the shape of the whole iceberg. And from that, I try to guess the shape of all the other icebergs that theoretically existed and never will. Um, and, but the details of this are gradually become clearer as we, um, we myself and my colleagues and collaborators uh, in this Gandharan uh, uh, enterprise uh, work through the materials we have. And that's why I'm here. Um, so uh, I just uh, want to conclude with um, a few words on, specifically on what I and my colleagues are doing with these manuscripts. Um, Jonathan uh, mentioned already in his um, introduction that I have published a translation, really it's a kind of preliminary translation of this text and it's in um, my book, um, Gandharan Bud uh, Buddhist Literature of Ancient Gandhara, which is on the table and actually I was pleased to see open to the appropriate pages where uh, I translate this whole thing. But that's j actually just the beginning. Translation is in a, with this sort of ma material and this sort of work, translation is not the main part. Um, so what I'm working on and why I'm here, other than, of course, to speak to you, but uh, to do uh, some of the detailed work uh, toward the production of a complete, uh, acad complete scholarly, uh, detailed philological edition, um, and that more for the specialists. So that will eventually take the form of one of those black books that you see on the table there. That's uh, a series called uh, Gandharan Buddhist text. So that's the academic uh, presentation of this material. My other book is meant more for the general readership. So um, one of these years, I don't dare be more specific on that, uh, I, I do commit myself that there will be a, a black book in the Gandharan Buddhist text on this uh, manuscript um, and hopefully Tomorrow I'll begin uh, making some progress uh, towards that. Uh, but for the meantime, uh, you can feel free to consult my translation. And this is uh, the book in question. This one already actually exists. So thank you for your attention. Be glad to answer questions. <clears throat> Please, yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you just say something about how the manuscripts, I mean, how we get manuscripts? How could we have these manuscripts? Yeah, uh, that's a, a, a little bit complicated. Um, the problem is that in, most, in nearly all cases, we don't really know where these manuscripts come from, and that's why I didn't talk about that. Um, uh, these, almost all of the manuscripts of this type have come up in, through private collections or antiquities market, and that is a, frankly, a, a murky place. Um, the people who have possession of them may or may not know where they actually came from, and they may or may not tell you, or they may or may not tell you the truth. Um, but what what we do know fairly certainly is that um, some, probably most, maybe all of them were originally in clay pots. Um, and we actually ha have, uh, not here, but in the British Library, we actually have the, one of the clay pots in which they came. And uh, these pots were buried under, probably under stupas or in a, in a near stupas in a monastery. So they put the manuscripts in the pots uh, sealed it up with a, a kind of, I think with probably with beeswax, uh, put a lid on it, sealed it, and they buried it 
in the stupa. Um, at least some of those came from uh, Hadda in Afghanistan, if you're familiar with that. Uh, they all come, they probably, all or most of them come from eastern Afghanistan, maybe from, some maybe from northwestern Pakistan. Um, and uh, so that's, unfortunately, that's all we really know. There, there are no cases um, where we have any of these manuscripts and know specifically, definitely, exactly where they came from, but uh, we have some uh, general uh, knowledge uh, about the, the provenance. It's a problem. Yes, please. Yeah, you may be referring to in, in Buddhist literature, they, uh, in, in Dataka, uh, actually in Atkata, uh, they talk about Taxila, which was the great city of that area, and they call it the university. But that's actually kind of an anachronism, and that's something it, modern scholars, uh, modern translators have used that term. But really, it was just a kind of center of learning, but not in a... Uh, a formal sense of a university. But in terms of propagation, well, we don't know very much about that, but there's one very important point that we do know, uh, and that concerns what I mentioned briefly before, the transmission of this material, I mean Buddhist literature in, in general, into Central Asia and uh, into China. So uh, there's a there's something called the Gandhari hypothesis, which I didn't talk about, but uh, I will for a minute because it's relevant to your question. Um, this is something that actually goes back to, I think, the 1930s. Um, it was first noticed that if you look at some types of Chinese Buddhist texts, and of course, Chinese Buddhist texts are, the canonical texts are all translated from Indian originals. Uh, and this was a, a huge enterprise that went on from the second century BC for, uh, I'm sorry, second century AD uh, for a thousand years. There was this enormous project of translating the Buddhist scriptures into Chinese. It's actually the biggest uh, and most uh, impressive translation project in the history of the world. Uh, I'll go out and, on a limb and say that. Uh, very few people outside Buddhist circles know that, but it's a, a major uh, achievement in, in world civilization, I would say. Um, now concerning that, uh, there was this idea called the Gandhari hypothesis, and what happened is that certain text scholars, philologists, were looking at the early Chinese translation, second, third, maybe fourth century, and, and looking at how they how they rendered the Indian names. And, and this was a problem because Indian names and Chinese names are extremely different and the structure of the language and the sound system are so different and the writing system, everything is different. So they struggled with representing uh, Buddhist Indian names in Chinese. But uh, some of these early scholars noted that there were maybe oddities uh, in the way that the names were presented which made them question what had been assumed, which it was assumed that the Chinese translations were made from Sanskrit. But certain of the features of the names actually didn't line up with Sanskrit, but they do line up with the corresponding Gandhari uh, pronunciations, like that slide I showed you, where you see the different uh, sound systems. So, uh, the Gandhari hypothesis then was that um, the but, uh, Chinese Buddhist texts, not all of them, but the early phase, were actually based not on Sanskrit originals, but on Gandhari originals. And the, one of the 
question marks about that theory was at the time and for decades afterwards, there were no Gandhari texts. Now, to make a long story short, there are. And uh, so this, um, this new material uh, definitely supports, I would say, proves the Gandhari hypothesis. So that's really, um, finally coming back to your question, the propagation, the historically important propagation is that these were brought by various people into China and uh, translated. They probably wasn't propagated in India proper because in India proper, the other regions had their own corresponding sets of texts in their own local languages and dialects. I hope I answered your question. Okay. Yes, please. Oh, uh, I didn't mention that. Is the facsimile their actual size? Close. Yeah. Um, the, in the back, you can look at it afterwards. Uh, I, about that long, does that, does that seem right? And the, so the original would have been somewhat longer. Um, the dimensions of these scrolls vary a lot. Uh, this is one of the shorter ones. Um, ah, yeah, thank you that long. Uh, this was um, probably, as far as I see, uh, was made from a single piece of birch bark. But of course, you're limited by the size of it. So there are, we, ha we have some much longer scrolls, some that are several yards long. But of course, they're, glue they're put together. We call them composite scrolls. Uh, they're sheets of bark, you know, typically you know, not longer than this. Uh, but there might be 10 or 15 or even more put together. I'm not, I'm having some doubts because there's, there's a, you can't see it from there, but there's a blank strip here and I wonder whether that's actually a juncture and whether this was made, put together from two separate pieces. So that's, I'm, I'm gonna be checking that tomorrow. Uh, the range, very wide range, there are some, the smallest ones are about this high, the longest ones are yards and yards long. Yes, please. I'm sorry, I'm I'm not hearing. Oh yes, uh, that's. I've, I've wondered about that. I, I'm not sure I understand it. Uh, in the list of 15, there's Shakyamuni the first, and of course it doesn't say the first, I just put together those numbers. Uh, he was number eight, I don't, I'm not sure, and then Shakyamuni the second. Um, but there's another point about that which I didn't mention. I, I talked about that list in the Mahavastu of 331,140,263 Buddhas. Um, what I didn't say is that out of them, 300, 300 million out of the 331, 300 million were named Shakyamuni. And there, according to that text, there was a stretch of three, uh, 30 million Buddhas in a row that were all, all had the, the same name. And I have thought about and failed to understand what that, why that is and why that, what that means. But there is, uh, um, you know, Buddhas are, in my impression, they're more or less the same. Um, and um, there are images, I don't think I have one here, but you, know, you see in Gandhara and other sculptures, you see sets of Buddhas, so the, like the seven Buddhas or sometimes eight Buddhas, and they're all almost exactly the same. Uh, so there seems to be a range of possibilities that Buddhas are always similar and they can be very similar and sometimes they are absolutely identical. But I, I'm still pondering that. It is hard to understand that. Yes, sir. Mm 
Yeah. Um, it, it's hard to give exact numbers. Um, let me explain the problem. Uh, there are groups of uh, manuscripts. Uh, there are six or seven major groups. And uh, typically, uh, one of these groups will typically have, say, two or three dozen manuscripts. But there's, uh, there's one group uh, which comes from a place called Bamiyan, which people have heard of because they were, everybody knows they were the giant Buddhas and the Taliban blew them up in 1990, uh, 1999 or whenever it was. Um, what the public generally doesn't know is that there are also thousands and thousands of manuscripts uh, found there. Um, and uh, most of those manuscripts were later manuscripts in Sanskrit, but there's an early phase of um, Gandhari manuscripts, so the, similar to what I've been talking about. Um, now, that contain, that consists of 300 or so fragments. And most of them are, when I say fragments, I mean like that. So it's very hard to say, okay, what, what is that? Is that 300 manuscripts or are they part, you know, how many manuscripts were they actually parts of? Um, and in most cases, they're so small that it's hard to be sure. So there might be 300 fragments, but there might have been uh, 50 or 60 manuscripts at a, a little more than a guess. So that's why the numbers are very fuzzy and that's why I've been a little bit vague. But I would say we have remnants. Well, I, I said 200. We have partial remnants of at least 200 manuscripts and possibly more than that. In terms of complete manuscripts or texts that are complete or more or less complete, you know, say 90%, very few, maybe three or four. Uh, this thing, I think I actually calculated, I don't remember, maybe we have maybe 80, 75 to 80 percent uh, of the original of this, and that's much, much better than usual. So it's a little hard to say exactly how much we have, but we do have a lot of material, uh, enough to, to really begin to get a, a glimpse of the big picture. Yes, please. Uh, the answer is almost all are Buddhist texts, not necessarily sutras, uh, but Buddhist texts of, of any kind with clear, clearly Buddhist um, uh, content, content and significance. Sorry, I broke your microphone. There are two exceptions in this, and all of these 200 or whatever manuscripts, there are two exceptions, uh, but they're really interesting. Uh, one of them is a, a kind of legal document. Um, the other, which was just discovered very recently and is about to be published by um, my colleague Mark Allen, you, you might know who he is. Um, and it's actually just little fragments of, a, what would have been a very interesting text, but it's enough to see what's going on. It's actually a record of the, mon the monastery's record of donations. And, uh, and not only that, it lists the names of the donors, and uh, the primary donor was uh, um, Wima Kadfises, who's uh, a well-known uh, figure in Indian history of around 100 AD. So this is really a great thing for us because it clarifies and confirms the historical uh, context. And very within that period that I talked about, that so-called foreign ruler period, and, and he he was previously known, but his Wima Kadfises, uh, his uh, relationship to Buddhism was not clear, and now we have it, and he was mentioned several times in this uh, text. As a, so it's not a Buddhist text in the sense that the others are, it's, it's, but it's monastic business, uh, and it's a real eye-opener. Uh, and this is going to be published in a few months.
definitely change the picture. Uh, but that's all we have so far of that type. Thanks again to everybody for braving the, the rain and wind.